Praise the Lord. Take your Bible, please. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 3. And today we're going to finish the message that we started last Sunday. Uh, the title of the message is Chain Breaker. This is Chain Breaker Part 2. And uh, as an introduction, we're going to show a video song entitled Chain Breaker. It was filmed at Hardin Prison outside of Nashville, Tennessee. So everyone, check this out that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. He is a chain breaker. Amen. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Father, Lord God, thank you for this passage of Scripture. Thank you for the freedom we have to read it, study it, preach it, proclaim it, apply it, live it. We pray for your Holy Spirit to come now, Lord. Anoint my mind, my heart, my soul, my spirit, my tongue, my lips, that I may proclaim the word of God without hesitation and um, proclaim it in such a way, Lord, that you will be honored and pleased and glorified and, and happy with the proclamation of your word and also for all the people here to receive it and apply it to our lives. So as we often pray, Lord, please you be glorified. Let your church be edified as we go forward and may your Holy Spirit have his way during this message today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, last week, um, if you were here or not here, I'm going to tell you, we, we dissected verses 4 through 12. We call that exegesis. Exegesis is the theological term when we critically explain and interpret the text of Scripture. In the process of doing that, we found out that John was writing in Aramaic. Aramaic is a dialect of Hebrew. It was the language that Jesus spoke. How many of you saw the, uh, the Passion of the Christ? The, the, the English words were on the bottom, and the, the language was Aramaic. But John was writing in Aramaic. And uh, we found out that he was writing in the present perfect tense. Now, when I was in college, my minor in college was English, but it wasn't grammatical English, it was English literature. So I had to really look this up and find out exactly what, what he was talking about in the present perfect tense. And we touched on it last week a little bit. But for instance, in verse number six, where we read, whoever abides in him, what he's really saying is whoever abides in him and continues to abide in him. It starts in the past, but it continues to the present. And uh, whoever abides in him does not sin or does not continue in sin. In the same way, verse number 9, whoever has been born of God or continues to be born of God, you know, does not sin, etc., etc. And all that to say that a Christian's life is different than it was before. It's a new life with a new heart and a new purpose. And sometimes, however, we fail, we stumble, we fall, we sin. And we go back to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But we should be walking in newness of life. We don't live in those sinful ways anymore. We, we have overcome or we're overcoming, and we don't dwell in that realm of existence anymore. Can I get a little amen right there, just, as, just to know that you're with me today? Amen. Romans 6.4 says this, it, we, we've been buried with him through baptism unto death. How many were baptized in water? Raise your hand. Do you remember when you were baptized in water? You went under the water symbolizing you died with Christ. How many of you came out of the water? I hope so. 
but, but just as he is risen from the dead by the glory of the Father, we also should be walking in newness of life. That means we don't live there anymore. We may take a wrong turn and visit every now and then, but when we realize we're over there, we repent and get back over here. So when we sin, when we Christians sin, it's what we would call an issue. It's a problem. And we repent of our sins. We confess to God. If we hurt a brother or sister, we make amends and we, we make things right. We do all we can do to preserve our integrity and our witness before the Lord. Now, last week we ended the sermon with a, a slide of an overview. We just want to put that up real quick just to get caught up to date here. So the overview of this passage, we find it in verse number five. You see where it says that? Verse number, number five. He was manifested. He came to take away our sin. In verse number eight, one of my favorite scriptures, he, at the end of that verse it says, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. I, I like that it says destroy in my translation. I, another, another word would be obliterates. I like that one even better. It's stronger than defeats. He does defeat Satan, but he, des he destroys him, he obliterates him, he wipes him out. That's why Jesus came. And when we get in, into that mix with the Lord, we can't help but be victorious. And then the third thing is in verses 9 and 10, he definitely came to give us new life in Christ Jesus. Aren't you glad you're at, you're at new life? You have new life and you're at new life today. As in the Assembly of God. <laughs> I always like that name. But anyway, he came to give us his seed, his spirit, his anointing. And he is definitely a chain breaker. When we come to the Lord, he, he breaks those sins off of us. So if you feel lost today, come to Jesus. If you feel discouraged or, or stuck or frustrated or defeated even, come to Jesus. He's a chain breaker. If you feel, if you recognize your own sinful heart and you're sick of yourself, you're at the end of your line, you can't stand yourself anymore, come to Jesus. He's a chain breaker. But I found out um, rather early on in my walk with the Lord that there's another side to this topic of the chain breaker. And let me try to explain it this way. When Pamela and I first got saved many years ago, we were going to a church in North Carolina, and there was a, a young man there about my age, and we, we struck up a friendship. And um, really good family. The, the family was basically raised in the church. He had a position, the, the father had a position in the church. Uh, always there, always at the prayer meetings, always serving the Lord. So this, this young guy, I, I, we, we, we became friends, but I was always curious, of, and I was a brand new Christian, but I always wondered why he always had court dates. And that was kind of a new term. I mean, I had a few court dates back in the day, but uh, now I'm a little bit older, and this guy had court dates. He kept having issues with probation or parole, and it seemed like people were always looking for him. And I, I realized uh, he was always in trouble, but he was always at church too. And I realized then that no matter how many chains God breaks. And this guy, as, as me and all of us, had a lot of chains broken when we came to Christ. But this person in particular, just using him as an example, although the chains were broken, he would pick up the chains uh, figuratively and put them back on himself through feeding his flesh, feeding his ego, feeding his, uh, feeding his pride, his arrogance, his rebellion. He was doing drugs, he was drinking, he was running with the wrong crowd, he was breaking into homes and stealing stuff to support his drug habit. Everybody in the church was really worried, but they were worried about me being hanging around with this guy, but I realized something's not right with this. And I realized, you know, then that no matter what God does, if we're not cooperating with the plan, his works will just be there and we'll be floundering around for the rest of our lives. He's looking for cooperation. Everyone say that word, cooperation. He wants us to cooperate with his plan. And his plan is to deliver us. And so I have a couple of scriptures here. You can look at them if you want. They're on the screen. But in Philippians chapter 2, you, you know this, this passage. I'm sure that you know this. It says Jesus, you know, emptied himself. He came to earth in the form of a bondservant. 
uh, as a man. And, and Paul says, let this attitude be in you that was in Jesus, that left you know, heaven to come to serve. And how Jesus gave his life, and he, he was obedient to the point of death. And how the Lord, the Father, raised him from the grave and then exalted him to heaven. And the, and the word says that the Father said, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that this Jesus is Lord. Right? But then it says in verse number 12, because Jesus did all of that. This is really interesting. You have to get this. He did all of that. Therefore, I'm going to go into verse number 12. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13, because it's God working in you both to will and to please the Father. Well, wait a minute. If God's working in me, what do I have to do anything for? Because it's cooperation. It's relationship with the Father. Jesus said, uh, the, Paul says, Jesus came and gave his life so that we could enter into this covenant with the Lord. But we have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. God is working in us. We have to cooperate with him. So what, what does that mean, work out our own salvation? You know why? Because my salvation is a little bit different than your salvation. And yours is a little bit different than that guy's salvation, and so on and so forth. We all have our stuff. And it's all a little bit different. It's, it's all the same, but it's all a little bit different. But work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Because it's God at work in you. See, my friend in North Carolina, God was definitely working in his life. He just wasn't cooperating at the time. I don't know whatever happened to him. I, I try to find them. I can't even find them. I hope, I don't know. I have to keep looking. But anyway, so work out your own salvation. You work it out with fear and trembling. In Colossians 3, another passage, uh, you don't have to turn there. I'll just read this to you. But in Colossians 3, verse 1, it says, if you've been raised with Christ, if, if you're a born-again believer, if you've been baptized and you, you, get the, you understand what that means, seek the things that are above. Don't seek the things on the earth. It'll only bring you down. He says in verse number 5, you now put to death your members. In verse number 8, you put off anger and wrath. You do it. Verse number 12, you put on tender mercies. In verse 16, you let the word of God dwell in you. Because God's at work in you, but he wants you to cooperate with him. And you, someone will say, I can't do that. And the Lord is saying, yes, you can do that. You have a seed in your heart. You have, you have life in your spirit. You have a new father. God will help you with all of that stuff. And so it's up to us to be obedient to the word. You know, he breaks the chains, but now he wants us to walk in obedience. And what about 2 Corinthians 5, 17? We quote it all the time. If anyone be in Christ, they're a new creation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The, the biggest word in the Bible is if. Well, who makes that decision? God doesn't make that decision. Every individual makes that decision if they want to be in Christ or not be in Christ. And so I, I want to, I just want to, uh, the message today is the chain breaker has done a tremendous work. He's just looking for a little cooperation, a little cooperation. So I want to give you three things to think about right here. And uh, we'll finish up this passage of scripture. Lord willing, we'll go to the next passage next Sunday. But the first thing I wanted to share is this is that as the chain breaker is looking for some cooperation, he's looking for an all or nothing decision. In other words, we cannot uh, enjoy the blessings and anointing of God unless we give our whole heart to him. I have never uh, heard this at a wedding, and we perform a lot of weddings around here. Now, some of you were married here, but I've never heard a, a groom say uh, to his bride-to-be, I, I kinda take thee to be my wife. Or, uh, I, I pledge most of my love, I want to save a little bit for, you know, I've never heard that, I never want to hear that, but it's always like a 100% commitment. And, and the same is true with the Lord. When he, he comes in, he breaks chains, he's looking for a 100% commitment back to him. And so that, in verse number six, it says, uh, if we... Uh, whoever abides in him, abides in him, whoever has seen him, whoever has known him. I want to talk about that for just a minute. If we abide in him and continue to abide in him, sin breaks off of us. One of the problems with my friend in North Carolina was he loved sin so much. 
He, he, would, he would go back and forth, and, but he, he never let the Lord really break it off. But when we're, when we're abiding in him, sin breaks off. Sinful lifestyles break up. They, they end. And, and remorse sets in when we violate the word of God. Examples would be Peter who denied the Lord when he realized, when he heard the rooster crow, he wept bitter tears. It always stands out in my mind. This man was broken because he really offended God. Um, David was the same way when he had committed adultery and committed murder and so forth. When he found out when the prophet Nathan came to him, David was beside himself and he repented and wrote several psalms about his repentance before the Lord. He was broken because of his sin. And not to mention Paul the apostle when he was persecuting the church. When he found out that he was really persecuting Jesus, he was broken inside and he gave his heart to the Lord. So there's a, a conviction of the Holy Spirit as we're abiding and continue to abide in Christ. In other words, if we get caught up in the gossip treadmill or, the, or we get caught up in uh, taking the Lord's name in vain or cursing, or we get caught up in some lustful thought or, or immoral behavior or attitude, or if pride or ego or arrogance comes into, into play in our life and we realize what's going on, we're grieved by it. We, we can't say, oh, well, it's just the way I am. No, we're, we're grieved by it, and we, we bring it to the Lord, and we repent of it, 1 John 1, 9. And then we go into this part where in verse number 6 where it says, uh, have you seen him? You, you know, and I want to ask the question, have you seen Jesus for who he really is? Have you seen him for what he's done? Have you seen him in light of your particular circumstance, your particular problem, your particular thing that you're dealing with? Have you allowed Jesus to see you and you see him in the midst of your problem and your situation? And then I think, you know, do you know him? Do you know the Lord? Do you know how the Lord feels about things? Do you know how the Lord processes stuff that goes on? Do you know what he did? And do you know how, what, he, what his expecta expectation is of you at this point? And I, I think, you know, Paul said in Philippians 3, he said, I, I've given up everything. I count everything as loss that I may know you and the power of your resurrection and, and the suffering or the fellowship of your sufferings. I wonder, has anyone ever suffered for Christ? I wonder, in my, in my mind and in my heart, suffering for Christ is one of the greatest honors. It it's not, doesn't feel good at the time, but it's a great honor to suffer for Christ. Someone belittles you for your faith. Someone makes fun of you. Someone writes you off. Doesn't even want to talk to you because you belong to Jesus. It's an honor to suffer for the Lord. But do you know him in that way? Amen. Have you given up everything to know, to know God? This is the whole point. It's 100%. It's either 100% or nothing. And I want to talk about three examples in the Bible that, that kind of illustrate this point. The woman caught in adultery. What a tremendous story this is. That this woman was caught in adultery, and the scribes and the Pharisees bring her before Jesus, and they're all puffed up, and they're ready to stone her to death. And they say, hey, Jesus, Moses says we should stone her to death. What say you about this? And, you know, Jesus writes in the ground. He's doodling something, and he comes up, and he says, well, let he who has no sin cast the first stone. And one by one, these guys disappear from the oldest to the youngest. I think the older had the more wisdom, I think. And they leave their stones, and they walk away. And Jesus looks at this woman. He says, I don't, I don't condemn you either. But then he says something that rattles, it rattles us today. It rattles me when I think about it. He, he says to her, go and sin no more. Amen. What? He, she had an encounter with Jesus. He's saying, look, your life is changed now. Follow me. Learn from me. Receive from me. You don't have to go back in that lifestyle anymore. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to save you. John 3, 16 and 17, by the way. And that woman, we don't know what happened, but go and sin no more. The Lord wants us, when we come to him, to lay down that lifestyle, whatever it is, lay it down. Zacchaeus is another example. I, I, you know I love the story of Zacchaeus. 
the little short man that climbed the sycamore tree to see Jesus walk by. He was corrupt. Nobody liked him. He was a cheat and a thief. He was a tax collector. He took money for himself and gave the rest to the Roman government. The Jewish people couldn't stand him. But he wanted to see Jesus. And there's a lesson in that, too, that even you know, sinful people want to see Jesus. And he sees Jesus walk by, and Jesus looks up and sees him in the tree, and he says, hey, Zacchaeus, come out of the tree. Today, I'm going to have dinner at your house. And the scripture says Zacchaeus hastily, quickly jumped out of the tree and gladly received Jesus. He had a hallelujah moment. He gladly received Jesus. Nobody told him anything. And he's, the first thing he says to Jesus is, whatever I stole, I'm giving, half, half, no, I'm giving half of my goods to the poor, and whatever I stole, I'm paying back four times. Nobody told him to do that. He just had a Holy Ghost moment where he knew he couldn't live his old lifestyle anymore. He had to change, and he was willing to change. He gladly received the Lord, and he was running after the Lord. I bet they had a great fellowship dinner that afternoon. I could just picture Zacchaeus talking a mile a minute, telling the Lord all his life and all his stuff and getting all his belongings, giving everything away and blessing people. But he had a life change because he had a heart change. And that's what salvation is. We change when we come into the presence of God. It's an all or nothing proposition. The rich young ruler is the last story on this one, but I love this story too. It's a sad story. But this rich young ruler... We don't know how old he was, probably, my guess, late teens, early 20s. Basically, he thought he knew everything. And he says to Jesus, I'm going to stump him now, watch this. How do you get eternal life, Jesus? And Jesus says, well, you know this, you know the commandments. You gotta, don't commit adultery, uh, don't murder, don't steal and lie, honor your mother and father. And the guy says, oh, I've done all that since my youth. Well, he was already a youth, but I don't know how long he's talking about. But Jesus says, it says, Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And so Jesus is saying, man, I can see right through this guy. He thinks he's so cool. He thinks he knows everything. I love him anyway. I'm going to give him another shot. If you want eternal life, sell everything you have and come follow me. And that poor guy put his head down and walked away sad. He walked away sad because he wasn't willing to give it all up for the Lord. I'm saying, if we want God's blessing, if we want the victory, man, we can't tiptoe through the tulips here. This is like, this is warfare. The Lord is calling us. He wants our whole life, our whole heart. Remember last week I shared with you that I accepted the Lord on four different occasions? You know what the problem was with the first three? I wasn't ready to give it up. I liked my sin too much at the time. By the fourth time, the Lord let me go a little couple of years. By the fourth time, I was begging, Lord, you've got to help me now. And I, by the grace of God, I have not looked back since then, praise God. It's an all or nothing proposition. Either you're in or you're out. Either, either you're, you're hot or you're cold. Either you're with God or you're not with God. And... Uh, and so he, he's a chain breaker. He's just looking for a little cooperation to complete the work. And you know, we, I always loved Philippians 1, 6. He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it until the day. It's true. He is, he is unrelenting. He's always trying to get us. Always trying to fix us. Always trying to, you know, get his way into our life. He's looking for some cooperation to go along with him. Amen? Amen? All or nothing. You're in or you're out. That's all it is. Second thing is this. The chain breaker, he wants to untangle us, but he's looking for a little cooperation in that. Many Christians, you know them, I know them, are entangled needlessly in sin, problems, complications, hardships, all because of undealt with sin. And I want to talk about this because personally, I've been there in the past. And I live in 1 John 1, 9 and 1 John 2, 1, where if we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive. And if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We have a relationship. 
We talk to the Lord. We, we praise the Lord. We, uh, we communicate. We, we pray to him. We talk to him. We worship him. We confess our sins before him. We have fellowship with the Lord. How many, I wonder how many of you have fellowship with the Lord when you're driving your car? That's a great place for fellowship with the Lord, by the way. Because traffic nowadays is nuts. But anyway, you fellowship with the Lord in your car. You fellowship with the Lord while well, you take a shower. Wherever you go, you're fellowshipping with the Lord. It's a good relationship. It's a, it's a, it's a healthy relationship. But I, I just want to say this. We, we can't allow 1 John 1, 9 to be our go-to place forever and ever and ever. Amen. Because sooner or later, something has to break here. What I mean is, I call it the Christian merry-go-round of sin. We commit a sin, we repent of the sin, some time goes by, we do exactly the same thing again, we repent again, some time goes by, and then we do it again, and, then we, and it's like an ongoing merry-go-round, round and round and round, and weeks go by, months go by, maybe years go by, believe it or not, decades go by. And someone doesn't have the victory. And, and I'm saying all God wants is a little cooperation here. He doesn't want us to be living bound up like that. There was a, you know, many years ago when I worked in a prison, a prison for youthful offenders, there was a young man in the prison that he probably served about two or three years and I was his counselor. And uh, the, the way they did it back then, they, these were young men, like 18 to 21. They would begin home visits when the guys were getting ready to be released. So I had to set up a home visit with his family. And uh, he would go home and come back and you know, gradually be free to go. After he did that a couple of times, he was begging the administration not to let him go home anymore. He was more comfortable in the prison where he was taken care of or had, had all the boundaries. And I'm afraid, I'm afraid that some Christians are like that. We're afraid to be free because when we're free, guess what? We have a whole other set of responsibilities and opportunities. It, it's easier for some people to be in the state of drama for the rest of their lives, in and out, up and down, confessing, repenting. If that's what it is, I'm not saying you're not saved, but I'm saying there's a whole lot more that God wants to do in your life. If he's the chain breaker, he's the chain breaker. Amen. And if he's the chain breaker for me, he's the chain breaker for you. But he just wants a little cooperation here. So again, a couple of scriptures to look at, and we, we won't have to turn to them. But uh, Romans 6.1 says, uh, Paul says, what should we do? Should we sin more so that grace would abound? That, that sounds like a great idea. Who cares? God will forgive us. I'll live in John, uh, Romans 6, 1, and I'll, I'll live in uh, 1 John 1, 9. And we'll just have a field day. But he says, he, uh, different translations, one says, God forbid, no. That's not what he means. We don't continue living in sin so that he could have more grace on us. We, 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 we fight against sin. Colossians 3, we looked at already, but another verse in that chapter says, set your mind on things above, for you died and your life is hidden with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Did we talk about water baptism? So when you were baptized in Christ, right? And you're, you come up as a new creation, and, and the old man has died, the new one has come, and, and we're expected now to walk in this newness of life. Romans 6 goes on to say, the old man has been crucified with him. We're no longer slaves of sin. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body. Sin shall not have dominion over you. And someone may ask, how many times should I repent? And the answer to that is, until you don't need to repent anymore. But don't, lose, don't use your repentance as an excuse to continue in the sin. This is why we have to talk about 1 John 1, 9. It's there as the escape clause, but it doesn't mean we live there. We go there when we have to, but we shouldn't have to live there. And God knows our heart anyway. So, so we need to get untangled. And, and maybe for some of us, it's a lifetime of getting untangled. But hopefully, the, the entanglements are getting less and less as we go along. And let me encourage you in this, that uh, 
There's Christian counseling available. There's pastoral counsel available. There's faith-based programs that are available, like Teen Challenge, or like uh, New Life Home for Women and Children, or things like Celebrate Recovery, or Overcomers, or even AA or NA are good beginning places. Not to mention the Holy Spirit is always available to untangle us. That's what was happening this morning. We had worship time. Worship is like surgery time. After the initial hallelujah, praise the Lord, then he gets into some business. You know what I mean? We enter into his presence and we feel the, the weight of the Holy Spirit on us. And that's when many times a word will come and, and, and things will be said in the service to, to challenge people to come, to come forward or to, to receive Christ or get closer to the Lord. But the Holy Spirit is always available to bring that conviction. One of the problems with that is that sometimes we're so wrapped up in the things of the world, we, we can't sense the Holy Spirit if he slapped us across the face. We're so wrapped up with news, entertainment, internet, etc., 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 we wouldn't know the voice of the Lord if, if he came back in person. But he, he doesn't want us to live in that place. He wants to untangle us. And so I would encourage you to have your worship time, have your prayer time, have your time of hearing the word of God preached and proclaimed. Have your teaching times. And let me say something about Wednesday night live stream. I've been enjoying it. We've been in Daniel. Uh, we're in Daniel uh, 3 right now. But when you come on to that live stream, can I tell you something? You, you can't get a lot out of it if you're doing the dishes at the same time. Or if you're watching the football game on another TV or whatever or you're preoccupied, you gotta, you gotta give yourself time to focus in on what's going on. And I'll guarantee you, some people have told me they love Wednesday night because we get into the word verse by verse. So we're talking about Daniel, right? Daniel's a young man that purposed in his heart not to eat the king's food. How did he get to that place? For many of us, that's a foreign idea. How do you get to that place where you know you can't defile, your, you can't defile yourself? You get into the Word of God. You apply the Word of God to your life. How do you get to a place where, like Daniel, when, when uh, he, the king made this decree, someone's got to tell me my dream and then tell me the interpretation of the dream. And everyone's saying, how are you going to do that? That's impossible. And Daniel says, king, give me some time. I'll get back to you. And Daniel goes to pursue the Lord, and the Lord reveals to him the king's dream which is a miracle, and then the interpretation of the dream. How do you get to that point? So what I'm saying is for a Bible study, you have, to, you have to get into the Word and make the Word applicable to your life and your situation. Those things that we talked about with Daniel have affected me, have affected the church. I'll tell you why. This whole thing about the 10 last Sundays, that came from Daniel. Daniel said, I'm not going to eat the food, but listen, give me some vegetables and water for 10 days and, and test us and see how we do at the end of 10 days. So the, the steward gave him that leeway and he, they looked better, they worked better, they functioned better than the other people. So out of, out of that Bible study, I'm thinking 10 days. Okay, we'll take 10 Sundays. I'll guarantee you, church, you give God your, these 10 Sundays, you come to church, you come to live stream without fail. No excuses, no whatever. You just put yourself in the house of God. I will guarantee you a change in your spiritual life. I'll guarantee it. Because I know what Matthew 6.33 says. If you put God first in your life and his righteousness, all the other stuff in life will be added to you. But God has got to be first. You want to get untangled? Give it to God. Don't give it to God and take it back. I remember I saw a skit some years ago. Remember this, Pamela? This brother gave a, gave a skit in our old church. And he, had all, he, like, he was going through all the motions, had all this weight on his back. And he emptied the thing out and put it down at the altar. And he was walking away. And he got tripped up on it. He couldn't get away. And he kept dragging around like this. And, and he put it back and he kept dragging it around. Some of us are dragging the ball and chain. Oh, God, free me, free me, free me. And yet we dabble, dabble, dabble. And God is waiting, waiting, waiting. He wants to untangle us. He did what he had to do. He just wants a little cooperation to go along with it. Okay, the third thing is this. We're going to close with this. The chain breaker 
uh, the chain breaker wants a little cooperation. He wants us to nurture the seed. Verses 9 and 10, it says, uh, whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his sin remains in him. The seed is the new life, the gospel, it's faith in Jesus Christ. How is your seed doing in your life? Is your seed uh, growing? Is it, is it developing? Because it's supposed to be. I'm, I'm always amazed at, at this point in my life that I, I learn new things all the time about, from the Word of God. I, I'm just amazed by all that. Like you think by now, I, I would think, well, I, I, I know a whole lot, you know? I'm amazed at these things. There's always something new in the Word of God. And even when we get to the end of our life, we still won't know it all. It's a, definitely a faith walk. But how's the seed in your life? You, you accepted Christ, you're born again in your spirit person. How's that seed of faith doing? Well, I, we don't have time to, to go here, but I'll just tell you, in Mark chapter 4, we have this parable of the soils. The soil meaning the heart. And the, the, the sower came and planted the seed. The seed is the gospel. And the seed landed on the different soils. And I want to ask you, how is your soil? How is your heart today? Because it doesn't just happen at salvation. I know, I've known many people in the beginning, their heart was good soil. They received the word of God. They loved, they would do anything for the Lord. But as life went on, their heart, their heart got hardened. Their heart got busy or tied up or whatever. And the word of God wasn't penetrating their heart anymore. So it's up to us to nurture that seed in our heart. But anyway, in the parable of the soils, some of the seed fell by the wayside. That seed is, is a seed that, that fell like off to the side and the birds came and devoured it. Jesus said, that's like when you receive the word of God, but Satan comes and steals it. I've known a lot of people that they heard it, they receive it for a little bit, but Satan comes and steals the seed of faith out of their heart. Other seed, he says, falls upon stony ground, like the ground in New England. It's all rocks and pebbles and stones, and it's rough. It's not, you can't go deep with it because there's stuff in the way. Jesus said, these are the kind of people that hear the word of God with gladness. They, they, but, but the seed can't go, go deep because of all the rock and, and problems come and issues come, and, and the seed never gets really implanted, and after a while it dies out. Other soil is thorny soil. The thorny soil is where there's, where there's uh, little prickers and little thorns and little things that, that choke out uh, the seed that was planted. And these are people that receive the word of God and they have pains and troubles and hardships. Who doesn't have them? But they use those things as an excuse to not let the seed grow anymore. Oh, he doesn't love me. He doesn't care about me. But others allow their soil to be good soil. It's healthy. And when the seed goes in there, they receive the seed and it produces up to 30 or 60 or 100 fold. It produces fruit in their lives. See, when I received the Lord the first time, there was no fruit at all. Second time, nothing. Third time, nada. Fourth time, I was done. I was dead to myself and alive to Christ and praise God, some fruit started to happen. So how is the fruit in your life? How's the, how's the soil in your life? I, I have a plant in my office. If you come to my office, uh, uh, Frank, you saw it the other day, we were over there. I love this, this plant. I got a little twig from my mother about four or five years ago. Little, little twig. And I put it in, in a pot, and I rooted it, and I put it in a flower pot. And, but after a while, after about two years, that plant did not grow. It didn't grow. I'm thinking, what in the world's wrong with my plant? I always water it. One day, about six months ago, I, I, I went to the pot. Where am I going with this story? <laughs> and anyway, the pot was heavy. I'm thinking, why is this pot so heavy? The plant's only this big. Anyway, there was all this old, dank water in the bottom of the pot that was killing my plant. So I took it out, I threw out the water, I got new soil. It was from the store, you know, that, that stuff in it to make it nice, nice and healthy and strong. I put my plant in there. My, you, this plant is unbelievable right now. It goes, uh, listen, there's four sprouts. Two of them go like this, all the way up, up the window and down again. 
and two of them on the other side go over to that side of the window and down. The whole four windows is covered with the plant. It's flourishing. God bless you. It's flourishing. And that's how God wants our lives to be. Flourishing, developing, giving fruit, giving life to other people, being an encouragement, being a blessing to people. So how do you keep your soil good? Just real quickly, three things. You have to worship God. You have to worship God. I heard this a long time ago. Worship breaks up the hard heart. I don't know about you. I, personally, I love music. I, uh, there's something about it. I love it. I love to listen to it. I love to sing it when I can. And it's just the melodies always, always amaze me. I love music. But music touches my heart. And music was designed by God to give him praise. When I made that connection, oh, that made a lot of sense. I'll, I'll let my music praise God, but there's something about the melody. There's something about the rhythms. There's something about the words and the lyrics. It, it touches our heart. It softens our heart to the things of God. So we worship God, and after we, that's why we worship God in the beginning. Then we get into the Word of God, because why? Our hearts are ready for the Word now. They're ready for the seed. So listen, be a worshiper. Develop worship in your personal life. I would encourage you, turn off the secular music. You don't need it. You really don't need it. And there's such good Christian music today, you don't need worldly music. You need Christian music that will glorify God and bring edification to the body of Christ. That will keep your heart good and, and ready for the word. Secondly, you've got to develop a prayer time. You've got to find a place to go to, if you can, every single day. Go there and pray. Whether it's five minutes or half an hour, whatever it is, go, go somewhere and pray to God. Pray to God. Don't just talk about it. Don't go to seminars about it. Don't do this. Just pray. Just talk to God. Yes. Include him in on your life. Yes. And I know it's hard to do that because you have so much going on, right? Take a few, take, a, take some time. Give it to God. Because when you have, a, you have a prayer connection, I call it the umbilical, the spiritual umbilical cord to the throne of God is our prayer life. So develop a prayer time. We have prayer here Monday nights at 6.30. We have prayer on live stream every Sunday night at 6 as well. And the, the third thing there is, is to get into the word of God. Like I was saying, our study in Daniel has touched my life. And I'm the teacher, but it touched my life. I can't, we didn't even get into the interpretation of the dream yet. Just the fact of what he's doing there is amazing to me. So Daniel's, Daniel was captive and brought over to Babylon. What's he doing in Babylon? They're trying to steal his faith, his religion, his language, his literature, his food. And this young man is steadfast in the word. He, he is not going to budge. I want that. I want that for you. I want that for my kids and my grandkids. How do you get that? Yes. Well, see, you study the word of God. You see, you, 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 you see these things and you say, well, how do we do that here? Oh, we have kids ministry. Praise God. Have a youth ministry, praise God. Yeah, we're running after God, praise the Lord. But anyway, the word of God says in Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's the word of God. Let it come in. Let it enter in to your life. And verse number 10 1 John 3.10, the, the manifestation of all that is, we live a righteous life, and we love the body of Christ. And that's what the Lord is looking for. So in conclusion of this portion, the chain breaker is looking for somebody to cooperate with him. Give Jesus everything. It's an all or nothing proposition. Claim your freedom and get untangled and nurture your faith, and nurture your seed. We'll close with verse number seven. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. Can we stand together? Come on. Let's say this together. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. One more time. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. So every, every head bowed, 
Every eye closed, because now this is the most important part of this message. We've been talking about cooperating, right? The, the chain breaker has done his work on Calvary. He's looking for somebody to cooperate with him. But I want to tell you something. If we say yes, it may mean we have to cut off a few friends that are bad influences on us. It may mean we have to stop buying certain things from the store that trip us up. It may mean if we're living together outside of marriage, we have to do something about that. It may mean we have to throw away our stash of pornography. For some people, it might mean stopping Instagram or Snapchat or some other social media because we know that it's immoral, it's bad for us to do that. Whatever it is, God is looking for some cooperation and it's going to cost us something. So now it comes from just preaching the Word of God to applying the Word of God. And, and again, I'm going to ask you to be brave. I can remember a time on a Wednesday night, I think I may have shared this, in North Carolina, there was an altar call given and the pastor said, anyone want to give up anything? Everyone had their eyes closed and I was playing the guitar in the background. This guy came up to the altar and put a pistol on the, on the altar, laid his gun right down on the altar. I'll never forget it. Some people lay down cigarettes right at the altar. Now, I don't know if anybody has anything on you right now, but I'm going to ask you, if you want to lay down your burden, even symbolically, no one needs to know. Only God needs to know what you're dealing with. But if you want to come up here and, 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 and figuratively, symbolically lay it down, the Lord would be honored. So the altar is open. Anyone want to cooperate? like, hey, Zacchaeus, come down out of the tree. This is like, hey, lady, I don't condemn you, but don't sin anymore. This is the rich young ruler making the decision, give everything up and come follow me. He chose not to. Anybody else, this is between you and the Lord. I just want to give it up. I'm sick and tired of this battle, this struggle, this thing. And I, I, I have to tell you, the, the stepping out means a lot to God. It means a lot to the Lord. He's a chain breaker. He just wants a little cooperation. Thank you for your word. Your word is very powerful, living, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing through joint and marrow, soul and spirit, discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. And Lord, right here, I think we're at a, a, what we call the moment of truth. It's like you're saying, will the real Christian stand up? So I think we have that going on. So thank you, Lord, for the response to your word today. I want to pray for those at the altar, Lord, those in the pews, those at home as well. Lord, whoever, whoever you're dealing with right now, give us hope, oh God. We may confess this thing for the thousandth time, but maybe this thousandth first time is a time when it breaks. 
Lord, let us never abuse your grace. Let us live in your grace and mercy, but never let, let us abuse your grace, O oh God. And Lord, let us always go back to 1 John 1, 9 when we have to. But we pray that those times will be less and less and less. We pray, Lord, that the chain breaker will come and do a new work in our hearts and that we would respond and follow his lead and do our part to be set free and to stay set free. So Lord, I pray for anyone now that may be struggling with a, with a deep issue, with an addiction, with a, with a lifestyle or something that's not pleasing to you, and yet their heart is, is sensitive to you. Lord, we, don't, we, we love everybody. We pray for them today. We pray, Lord, that all of us, none of us have arrived yet anyway. What am I saying? None of us have arrived. Lord, we're all in this battle together. So we just pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to come. Give us a fresh anointing, a fresh infilling today, a, a fresh emboldenedness that we, we may walk this walk that you've called us into. Yes, Lord, forgive us our sin. Yes, yes, Lord. But Lord, now empower us. Give us the victory, Lord. Give us the, the, the wisdom and the guidance to say no when we have to and yes when we have to. Help us, Lord, to live in Colossians 3 and Romans 6 and, and, and Philippians 2 where we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Help us, O oh Lord. So we thank you and we praise you for it. Lord, I just pray for everyone to sense your presence. As we leave here today, Lord, let us leave encouraged. Let us leave here today starting a, a new page in our life. That the chain breaker is not done with me yet. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to partner with the chain breaker and get my life in order. We thank you. We praise you for it, Lord. And pray for your perfect will to be done in our lives. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I think we need to do that a little better. Can we do that? Let's give the Lord a shout of praise. Ready? Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. God bless you. Go in victory today. There will be the prayer, uh, prayer meeting live stream at 6 tonight. So uh, we'll see you there hopefully. But have a great day. Jesus loves you. God bless you on live stream.